So I just sat down and binged the first season of Yellow Jackets, and oh boy oh boy did I love it. I found this to be so exhilarating and exciting and terrifying. I loved this show so much. I had heard that it was a bit of a Lord of the Flies situation, but a bunch of girls instead of boys. But to me, this really feels like a perfect combination of Lost meets The O.C. meets Alive meets... Pretty much any HBO show that has an anti-hero kind of main character situation where you're watching someone and you're like, that's not a good person and they're doing bad things, but you're just kind of, you're just kind of, you know, on board with it, or at least you enjoy them as a character and you're just like, oh, oh, oh. ah, there's just, there's something about that sweet secret herbs and spices that HBO and other HBO-like streaming services like to just sprinkle all over their characters, where you're just like, they are the worst, but I love them. And this show has many of them, my favorite being Misty, who is terrifying, utterly terrifying, but I love her. The first thing that really stood out to me in this series is the soundtrack. The score is chilling. It is so upsetting. All that chanting and humming and just weird kind of chorus choir kind of just singing and chanting and just ah it is so upsetting and unsettling it just gets under your skin and it creates such a mood and an atmosphere and it works so well to get you into this horrible mindset that these characters are going through on this not island what is it in the woods just in the in the wilderness and it is so good like straight off the bat that was like the main thing where i'm like wow exceptional soundtrack just I love it so much. But unfortunately, unlike a Game of Thrones soundtrack or other soundtracks that I love so very much, it, I don't I don't think this is gonna be one that I'm gonna be listening to as like I edit or as I like play a video game. It, it's, it's just too upsetting. The second thing that really stood out to me is a really interesting and like kind of thoroughly engaging way to tell this story, even though you might think at first that it's not gonna work, is the fact that we are seeing them on the islands. Sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep saying this. This reminded me so much of Lost, my, one of my favorite series of all time. So I am going to keep accidentally saying that. But if I say the island, I mean the wilderness. The idea that we're seeing them on the island, in the wilderness, but at the same time we are also seeing them 25 years later, knowing that a bunch of them survive. I just found really interesting and really cool to kind of see how they've been psychologically damaged and how some of them at first don't seem like they're that bad off, and you're kind of like, huh. It, it seems pretty bad. Like we got, a, we got a couple of snippets in that first episode where they're all dressed in the wool and the bear furs and all that stuff. And it's snowing and they've chased someone. They fall into a pit and it's gone like full Law of the Flies times 10. And it's just crazy and terrifying. All of that stuff in the snow that kind of shows the cannibalism. There is something so animalistic and terrifying the way they're all rugged up. And obviously that's for like the snow and to survive, but it also just makes them so unhuman and really upsetting and kind of unnatural and it felt so kind of odd and almost supernatural which also plays into a theme throughout the season of people's psyches and people misreading or reading things in a certain way and how it could be something kind of beyond our realm of understanding which i found really interesting and really engaging throughout the season and how people are kind of reading this very intense traumatic kind of thing they're all going through but that first scene when you realize they've killed someone slit the throat and they're eating them and they've resorted to cannibalism as this kind of like this is where they get this is like an end point i found so horrifying and exciting and the thing i found so ingenious is you can't tell who any of them are so you have no idea which ones which you don't know who is died you don't know who the queen Antler b lady is you don't know who any of them are and it's just it's just ingenious, like visually, like just on a visual level, truly terrifying and upsetting. Some of the best visuals I've seen in something, just so awesome, but upsetting and terrifying, yet just so clever on just like a basic mystery level of being like, who's under them woolly furs? You don't know. You don't even know who the antler chick is. Like at the end of the season, episode nine, we see Lonnie kind of look similar to that or pretty much the same, but we have no idea if someone doesn't just take the mantle of the antlers. But considering what happens in the last five minutes of that finale, my money's on Lonnie because she's the most terrifying woman I've ever seen in any show. She makes me truly scared. Her expressions and just mood in those last two episodes made me so upset. Like, truly chilling. Like, the performance in this are stunning. I get to a point where I don't know if I like any of them sometimes because it's just so 
upsetting and intense and knowing they get to that point like i kind of love that they show and explain so much in a way where they go here's what happens at the end here's like four of them 25 years later clearly they're traumatized by some really awful things that's like one little slice of how bad it gets and then slowly the whole show just takes its time just slowly breaking these girls down and the boys and it's just like really really clever and upsetting and terrifying and just Oh my god, I I was on the edge of my seat for the whole 10 hours. Something I love trying to piece together and figure out throughout the season was who will survive, who is going to be those seven or eight characters that we're going to see in the future 25 years later. The idea of showing us four of them straight off the bat, I found really interesting because you're like, okay, so these ones are going to survive. Does that mean that they've gone full hard into it? Do they kind of instigate things? Like what kind of leads everyone to these places? Something I was surprised that I enjoyed so much in this series was their kind of balance of this kind of terrifying, we're stuck in the wilderness. What are we going to do to survive? and eat but also balancing that with the kind of melodrama kind of teen angst of having all these teenage girls and a couple of boys and the teacher and having all these OC vibes just kind of permeating throughout like all these scenes where they're also trying to survive and hunt like I don't know when, when they were practicing to just like learn who could shoot the gun the best that kind of played out like a scene in a high school where they're all competing to see who's the best but the reason they're trying to you know figure out who's the best at the gun is a life and death situation and somehow the show really balanced that really really well like there was no times when all the teen angst and drama was kind of coming out did i go uh i feel like maybe they should like focus on like the real problem of surviving because it's at a certain point they're there for so long that things are going to build up and come out and they are all teenagers i just felt it was so cleverly balanced and i think it worked really really well in the finale where jackie and shauna just went at it like them going at it and her like calling her out for trying to kill travis when they're all tripping on shrooms which was the most upsetting thing i've ever seen in my life just super super chilling i hated how they were just they are oh, just it really really upset me i'm really glad that wasn't the first kind of kill and then eat cannibal kind of moment it was just kind of unleashing a bit of that kind of wild nature in them but I feel like if you're going to make, if you're like going to go down this path of cannibalism, I would really hate for the first actual time it happens to be because of shrooms. Oh, the drugs made us do it. I really want it to be a psychological thing where they get to a point where they can't, like there's no other thing, there's no other option to do to force, put these characters in this spot. But the whole shrooms kind of situation was a really interesting way to kind of slowly kick off this kind of animalistic nature in them and to kind of push them in a certain way. But that moment in the cabin between Jackie and Shauna where they just go at it because of one of them sleeping with her boyfriend and all that just classic the OC type of situation was just really, really sad and really intense. I didn't know which character I agreed with. I kind of agreed and disagreed with both of them. It was just super compelling TV. And then they make her go, stay out in the cold, and you're like, damn, I that's that's a shame. And you kind of, like, I kept waiting for, like, kind of parts of, like, the, the group to kind of splinter and split off to be two different kind of factions. I'm pretty sure that happens in Law of the Flies, or maybe it doesn't. I don't really remember. For some reason, I kept kind of waiting for something like that to happen. So I was thinking because of this huge fight and this split between the group and Jackie not having done the shrooms and seeing how completely monstrous and crazy they all were, and them all being like, actually, screw you, we're just being all spiritual and, you know, maybe, maybe we're going to murder him. Who cares? Shut up. Damn you, Lonnie. You... Ah, oh my god, Lonnie makes me so scared. I I was gonna say you crazy lady, but I would I wouldn't even say that. Like even saying that now, I I take that back, Lonnie. <laughs> you're 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 totally n normal. So I was expecting that moment where Jackie would go outside and maybe Travis and Nat would come back and they would kind of form like a little crew outside of the main crew because obviously they all tried to kill Travis and Travis would be like. That's not really cool. And that would be like, yeah, that's that's not cool, guys. But unfortunately, what we get was so much more sad and just tragic and heartbreaking. That moment where she comes back into the house and at first you're like, okay, cool. They've just settled it. Okay, it was a bit of a fake out finale kind of thing. And then suddenly everyone's just acting a little bit too weird. The color just looks a bit odd. The mood, like the mood and atmosphere in this series, they're able to suddenly make you just feel so like on edge and just like, uneasy and just like i don't know i felt like a chill going down my spine and then suddenly you look at them all and they're like we all forgive you we love you and you're like no that's not right like for a second i'm like wait are they gonna bring her in and like kill her all together but then coach was still there i'm like no he hasn't kind of gone a little bit loopy like some of the girls have started to go already so this is going to be a dream of some sort and then suddenly realizing 
she's gone mad in the snow freezing to death and she's having a dream and then to see her there and the reason she's frozen to death is because the snow has kicked in so like the first kind of death oh sorry sorry laura lee exploded in a plane which is i don't know super intense but i don't know i just i just knew that wasn't gonna work that felt like in lost where they're like we're gonna get off this uh, bloody beach there's we got a raft and the you know the raft doesn't get them to safety the plane felt like that like a thing they had to do to kind of make you feel like there was progress in the season to try and get out of the wilderness I, why did it explode the bear was just on fire and then she exploded i don't i don't understand why and so with jackie's death which was super traumatic and just like generally upsetting i felt really sick like the last 15 minutes of this finale of season one just jaw on the floor goosebumps on my goosebumps just freaking out like i just couldn't believe how like, kind of emotionally intense it was it really really upset me i also found it kind of beautifully horrifying that like the first snow that has fallen like literally freezes someone to death because of this split in the group and this argument that kind of does feel so trivial now that she's died because of it but also we know that in the future they're all rugged up like bears cannibalized you know eaten eaten human like cannibals and that's in the snow so it's like i don't know the snow falling suddenly feels like like another like i don't know it's like the next level has started like it really felt like a great way to kind of push us into that like kind of direction towards the cannibalism it just i don't know it just really worked as a kind of an ending chapter to the first kind of arc of this story one of the other things i really really loved in this season was lonnie having dreams and she has dreams and then they essentially come true but you can interpret it either way. It was a really interesting way to kind of handle how people kind of read situations and signs in these really extreme intense moments or just how they read them in general life. A lot of the stuff and how people would debate Lonnie's dreams or visions, if you will, reminded me a lot of my favorite line in any M. Night Shyamalan movie in the movie Signs, where they discuss miracles are whether or not miracles are coincidences or miracles. And it's just how people read these signs in life. And there's just kind of two ways of thinking and one is kind of more spiritual and religious and the other side of it is more kind of grounded in reality and science and that's like the main theme of lost so the idea that this show was also doing it which reminded me so much of lost i just love it it's just like are they a man of faith or a man of science and in this case i suppose woman of faith woman of science and it was just I just love that kind of debate of the two ways to kind of look at the world and i found it really really interesting how it's like at times you're like she she's definitely got actual visions like because she's actually seeing visions but then at the same time maybe things have just happened in her life where she's like like she thinks she saved her parents in a car crash but did she is that just a coincidence or is she like actually like some kind of crazy prophet and i just i just find that super compelling and the fact it's takes her down a path we know it takes her down a path to cannibalism at one point it's just super chilling and upsetting i just yeah i found that really really interesting and i kind of love because at first it feels like it's very realistic and grounded and then at a certain point you're like wait is this supernatural is there something else going on is this actually going to go full lost but then it kind of pulls it back and goes well i don't know you can kind of read it both ways and i just found that really really interesting i liked that there wasn't a moment where you go ah yeah no that's that's super like supernatural. There's no way anyone can like deny it's not. I can see why they would because they're women of science or whatever, but no, no, definitely magic. I like that it's just super, super vague and it just leaves it up to your interpretation, which I found really, really cool. So my favorite character for this season is easily Misty. Misty is so, so good. All the casting for young than older ones for the four that we get are really, really good. But Misty takes the cake. I, it might just be the hair because the hair is so similar and kind of glasses. It's kind of like a, you know, a visual cue to make them feel similar. But they just, they look identical. Their performances are really, really kind of entwined and they feel really connected. Like, not to say the others don't, but this, like, Misty, maybe it's just because I love the character as well. But I thought that was exceptionally done. She is so kind of tragic and I feel so sorry for her. But at the same time, she does some crazy horrifying intense things like she's now become another one of my favorite anti-heroes like just straight away after one season just already up there on the list of just people who do just the worst things ever but i'm like well i mean i'm kind of on her side because we're just like following her but at the same time oh my god just like what was it was like the second or third episode where she sees like the the pilot box that'll like help people find them and after hearing one compliment 
one girl compliments her once and that's so like empowering and important to her because she's been so downtrodden and so like mocked and teased and bullied and all these things that one compliment she hears she's like nah yeah maybe we should just stay like here on this island like yeah let's just stay and like smashes the box it's like you know what's gonna happen but seeing her do it it's just like Oh, and like knowing at a certain point that they'll all turn on her because they just kind of don't like her, which is so tragic and sad, but she's just like a little bit too much, a little bit too weird. No one vibes with her. She kind of makes it hard for people at sometimes, but she's just trying because she feels so lonely. Like, I don't know. I found her character easily the most compelling, easily the most tragic, but then sometimes she'd do crazy stuff. We like, don't poison coach with shrooms so he'll have sex with you. Like, that's crazy. That's, that's like so wrong. But you see where she's coming from. And yeah, I don't know. That moment where they're all like, get out of here. We don't want you to help us. We eat the bear and make the bear and do all the choppy chop for the bear. We don't want you near the food. And finally, that kind of term, we like, see, it wasn't going to be worth it. You want to stay on this island. Sorry, wilderness. You want to stay here with all these people because you're like, you know, really like good at all this stuff. And you have all this knowledge and you're helping them all out at the start. But like, I just knew that turn would happen again. And it does, and it's super tragic. And it's kind of like even more tragic because all these insecurities she has about not being beautiful and not being loved, you can see that 25 years later, no matter what happened on the island and her feeling empowered at first, it just comes back. And she's like the same girl she was back then, just more murdery. Just pretty murdery. And just like that whole kidnapping subplot, just, oh my God. Despite the fact that kidnapping is bad. I'm not saying it's not bad. I was kind of enjoying like the growing budding friendship of Misty and lady that she's kidnapped in the future in the 25 years later kind of stuff. I was really enjoying that how at first it was like so kind of intense and horrible. Oh my God, she's torturing her and kidnapping her and all this stuff. And then as you realize like, oh, she's this other lady has no part in any of this. She's literally just what she says she is, what we knew she was. And then you start to go, wait, are they becoming friends? But then she's like letting her go and it's like, ah. Oh, naive, foolish Misty, what are you doing? Like, I was, like the whole time she's leaving the house, I'm just waiting for her to get hit over the head and for it to cut to black and like that be the kind of cliffhanger to end us on. Like, oh no, she, she got hit in the head. What's going to happen to Misty? Um, <laughs> but as she's driving away with the cigarette, like I was waiting for her to pull over and do a call or something to happen. And then as you realize she's getting woozy and you're like, oh, Misty. I shouldn't have doubted you, Misty. You, I, I should have known you were going to do something truly awful and terrifying and poison her via cigarettes. And to do the double bluff or the bluff or bluff situation where she puts them in the bin, like making sure like, cause she like knows and she knows that like, I don't know. I just found that so horribly kind of insidious the way she's like, well, if I just leave them there, maybe she'll be sus. But if I put them in the bin as if I don't want her to smoke them, she'll smoke them. Like just... I don't know, just so many layers to the kind of horrible monstrosity. It's just... <laughs> I love Misty. Let's be clear. I love her. It's She's incredible. Horrifying, but incredible. Unlike, say, Lonnie, who's just horrifying. Just... Oh my lord, I, I am so upset. Uh, just every single time she said anything in those last few episodes... I just found her really, really scary and upsetting. And then at the end of the season, when Nat is getting kidnapped, like that moment when Nat's about to kill herself, I'm like, oh, I don't like the idea that she's going to kill herself. But if they're going with the whole Travis did actually kill himself, I guess she's going to kill herself. And it's going to be kind of like the opposite of a Romeo and Juliet situation. And it's kind of like, I guess that makes sense because she made the promise that she never would, but he broke that promise. But then I kept thinking, but he didn't. Like they've come back around being like, oh, because of the whole Jeff situation, it's deaf. And like the whole misconception of like a miscommunication, just that complete madness, which really took me by surprise, um, which I'll get to in a second. Cause I thought I had a big issue with that. And then it just kind of flipped the table of that whole plot. And I just, oh, I loved it. But back to Nat, as she had the gun to her mouth, I was kind of like, oh, but just like, isn't she thinking about the candles? Like the symbols and the candles, like he didn't kill himself. Someone removed those candles. Like, why is she forgetting that? And I guess she's just so wrapped up in grief. She's like forgotten this huge major plot point, like the main reason it's clear it wasn't a suicide. And then as it happens, knock, knock on the door. And I'm like, who's it going to be? And I presumed it would be a reveal of like, it's me from the island. 
Let's just go with it. It's on the island. I'm just going to keep saying that. I'm sorry. You know what I mean. Island equals wilderness in this review and in for season two. I'm just, I'm warning you right now. It's just, I'm going to keep saying the island. And so I expected a big reveal with the door would open and it'll be like, ba bomb It's this famous actress or, you know, relatively unknown but kind of known actress and she's like it's me that's character i survived too or something and it would end up like oh my god shock and all we cast this person as this person but no it's a bunch of super super weird creepy tracksuit mask wearing just absolute weirdo looking guys and they pick her up and they carry her out and as this is happening the lady on the phone's like what the hell have you got me into who's lonnie chills like just like my chills had chills and those chills were afraid of the other chills. It just, I was so on edge. I don't know, something about that. I think it's probably mostly just the music and just the building tension of horror, but they were so odd and weird. And I don't know, like, I feel like up until this point, I never thought there was like this bigger conspiracy thing going on. Like one character said, you just want it to be a big conspiracy. I'm like, yeah, does that make sense? But now thinking about it as it kind of cuts between Lonnie finally kind of losing her mind and she's got the big bear heart she's putting it down and there's all the kind of ritualistic like kneeling and all that kind of stuff going on as the snow falls and you're suddenly like okay Lonnie's kind of snapped now like she's she's on the way for cannibalism now she's all up for it already and the idea that if she has survived she's got this cult of weirdo people and she's maybe created an actual cult or something and it's just i don't know it all kind of clicked into place in a really upsetting way where it just i don't know it just felt so kind of like expansive and big and just yeah just scary just just scary so one aspect of this series that i didn't have like an issue with was generally i actually was overwhelmed by how much i enjoyed this show and it wasn't an issue issue because the actress who's playing 25 years in the future shauna is kind of our main character we focused the most on her and so her whole plot with jeff and kind of the knowledge of what happened to jackie like we don't know what happened to jackie but we know quite early on that jackie definitely doesn't survive which i also thought was kind of interesting to be like oh shit so like they've confirmed she dies so like i don't know they're kind of using that to kind of inform the character now with jeff which makes a lot of sense and i really liked that i liked how they pick and choose how much we know about what's going on. It creates a lot of kind of interesting tension where they kind of can put tension in certain places. Like when they were about to kill Travis with the knife, I was like, wait, are they gonna kill Travis and eat him? And it's gonna turn out that Travis that we've been seeing in the future is actually Harvey? And for some reason, like, I don't know, like they've switched it or I don't know, something like the name change for some reason. Like, I don't know, like there was a lot playing in my mind with those um, kind of ideas and thoughts because of what they are showing us. And we never actually see Travis. Like they say it's Travis. And she's like, yeah, I'm with Travis. But do we know? Like, what do we know? But no, he'll he'll survive. He'll clearly survive. It's, it's Travis. I don't know why I'd be Harvey. It's, it'd be weird if she's like, actually, I, I also like your brother who's 12. Yeah, no. I don't know why I thought that. I just, I just was thinking lots of ideas, lots of, um, lots of ideas. And sometimes when you're brainstorming, you know, in a brainstorming session, there's no bad ideas. Admittedly, that is a bad idea and a bad theory. But as I said, no, no bad ideas. So the one issue I had with Shauna's plot is that she meets this mysterious, sexy, charming younger man. And he's all like, oh, I love you. And like, she is a sexy, awesome kind of fun lady, mostly. I mean, you know, he doesn't know her trauma. Oh, he does. It doesn't, you know. But I can see why they would get it off. And I can see why they would kind of be, you know, into each other and all that stuff. And Jeff and her whole marriage and all that's falling apart. She kind of hates her kid because her kid just resents her and all this stuff. So you're like, I understand how it could happen. But to me, it was just like, but there's like this whole other thing going on. And he arrives at that exact moment and you like bumped into him. But like, did you? And I don't know, there was just so much where I'm like, he's just sus. Like, he's just, he's just so sus. I'm kind of annoyed by how obvious it is. I kind of just want them to reveal it. And then, like, as I'm thinking that, well, like, oh, a couple of Epi's day, just, just reveal it. The daughter's like, like, he's got his name here. I googled him. He's nowhere on the internet. And she's like, oh, damn. Oh, damn. And suddenly it's like, okay, he's sus. They've revealed it. We can just kind of move on and deal with this. And then she confronts him. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And they get into this big thing and she kills him. And as soon as she stabs him, I'm like, oh my God, he didn't do it. It's Jeff. Oh, like, because when she's in the closet and all the stuff's there, my first impression was like, oh my God, it's in the house. It's Jeff. How does that make any sense? Is he evil? How is he evil? Like, 
I don't know, my mind exploded. And then she's like, oh, it must be that sexy, charming guy I just met, Adam. And I'm like, oh, wait, of course, because he's in the closet. That makes a lot of sense. But it's such a clever and fun reveal to be like, it's so obviously Adam. And Jeff is just like, not the kind of guy to be sinister, but he wasn't being sinister. He was doing it for money because he took money from loan sharks and he's so incompetent. He needs to do this. And he thought this would be the only way. It's just, it's genius because every character still makes sense. But all my kind of preconceived notions of where a story usually goes in this situation. And they just flipped the table. They just like completely subverted my expectations in such a genius and fun way. I just found that super awesome. And then kind of almost hilariously comical and insane how, I don't know, not desensitized because of the cannibalism and all the horrors. But they kill this guy and she's like, well, better get the crew together and better, you know, cover up this murder. And it's just like, I almost felt like a Desperate Housewives episode at that point where they're all just like into this ridiculous heightened situation. And then they're like, to the high school reunion, everybody. <laughs> Let's have shots. <laughs> we just buried my ex-lover who didn't do anything wrong. We just, I just flat out killed him. Incredible. I just love it. Like, he did literally nothing wrong. I really enjoyed that. It was really, really fun because as it's happening, I'm like, yeah, cool. He's a bad guy. Why is he a bad guy? Who cares? But the fact that Jeff just needed money and all this stuff just happened to be happening coincidentally with Lonnie's cult or whatever the hell's going on, which is the main kind of plot of the 25 years later, I suppose. I just found that really exciting and interesting. And just, yeah, overwhelmingly just like, yes, they have fixed my only minor issue. It wasn't even a big issue, but it actually became one of my favorite parts of the season. Like, Jeff just realizing everything is happening. He's like, wait, you've been cheating on me? I, I haven't been cheating. That girl's part of the loan shark. She scares me. And then she's like, oh, what? You thought I was actually going to book club? He's like, what? Book club isn't real. And I found that so funny. Just so, so overwhelmingly hilarious. Because his whole database wrangling or whatever the hell he was saying and doing it all night and early morning deliveries and all this stuff was just so, so kind of obviously he's cheating. Just oh, like his daughter thinks he's cheating. Like everyone thinks he's cheating, but it's such a clever kind of subversion of expectations, flipping the table just because like, nah, I guess he is just having lots of financial trouble. So he's trying to figure it all out and he's taking him all night because he's mildly incompetent. I love it. It's so good. I just, ah. I love this show. One of the most bizarre and spooky aspects of this season was Ty and her sleepwalking, sleep doing real bizarre things situation. Like that moment where we see her eating all the dirt and being all disgusting and monstrous. And like at first you're like, well, that might just be like a weird vision and a weird trippy kind of situation. But then we see her in 25 years later doing the same thing. We find out she's the creepy other woman looking through the window that her son keeps seeing which is really upsetting and it's just like these really odd bizarre moments like the fact she's just like up in a tree and she's got the bone thing that didn't have the blood on it took it from her girlfriend and has the flare gun just up in a tree just like really little small weird bizarre things that just kept getting odder and odder and because they weren't so vicious and disgusting and brutal, they were just weird. I was like, okay, that's an interesting little subplot. But she's so afraid in the future, 25 years later, of what she's doing that like, you're kind of like, well, something must have happened that's more than just eating dirt and being up in a tree. Like something must have gone really, really wrong. What does she do when she's sleepwalking? Like how far does it get? Like what kind of monstrosities could she possibly do to be that afraid? Where she tells Sean at one point, like, you know how bad it can get. And she kicks her family out and all these things. But I honestly, honestly, truly did not expect for her, for the reveal to be that she actually killed the dog. And not just killed the dog, like accidentally. Like when we have that really spooky scene where the, the wife comes through down into the basement and just the way it's positioned at the end of the season, the end with the music and the, the weird vibe. I'm like, wait, is the wife evil? Did the wife kill the dog? Cause the whole season I had a suspicion the wife might've written spill on the wall and just kind of blamed the child kind of being like, what's, what's the deal here? What, what am I trying to figure out here? Cause something's up. It turns out it's not just sleepwalking. It's sleep, killing a dog, beheading it, putting it on an altar shrine, just nightmare situation like seeing that because that one she's like crawling through and you're like okay no so she's not the bad guy the wife's not the bad guy she, uh ty has killed the dog tragic but maybe an accident like maybe she just kind of goes a bit loopy and she accidentally killed the dog and she's hiding it but no she's beheaded the dog put it on a shrine and the baby toy is there and just 
honestly so chilling, so disgustingly horrifying and shocking as well. Like you can kill a hundred children, but you don't kill a dog. That's like the standard movie TV show rule. So to have a beheaded dog on this shrine altar thing and having that that terrifying symbol that we see in the woods that has inspired all this kind of crazy spiritual madness that's gone through them all or what's going on like we don't really know what's happened at this point it's still super super vague which i do love just oh that mystery oh i am slurping it up like a delicious boost juice of horror that's a bizarre combination of things i don't know why i said that but then coupled with the fact that she won the election because of course she won the election what was she gonna not win the election <laughs> that would be bizarre but then that smile where she's like happy she's won the election but because of the knowledge of what we've just seen and just had revealed to us that smile comes across as so perverse and upsetting just what a what like oh my lord so many moments at the end of this season that were just so wonderfully perverse and terrifying and just oh my god i am so excited for tomorrow season two comes out i got in just in time with season one and i could not be more hyped